Hello and welcome everyone to this second of three Women in Translation readings as we celebrate Women in Translation Month. I'm Alex Zucker, a past co-chair of the PEN America Translation Committee and a past organizer of Women in Translation events for the committee, which advocates on behalf of literary translators working to forward a wider understanding of our art and offering resources for those with an interest in international literature. Today's event is also being hosted by PEN America, and I am grateful to Alia Gatto from PEN, who's managing the Zoom for us today. PEN America's commitment to support women's voices in translation builds on the efforts by blogger Maytal Radzinski, whose mission to raise awareness of translated literature by women queer and non-binary authors, uh, whose mission is to raise awareness, sorry, of translated literature by women, queer and non-binary authors. For bringing together today's stellar assemblage of translators and authors, I'm very excited about this. Thanks go to the three co-organizers of this event series, Nancy Naomi Carlson, Esperanza Hope Snyder, and Catherine E. Young. We hope that you'll register and join us for the final event, which is scheduled for Thursday, August 31st at 1 p.m. Eastern time to hear a third slate of author translator pairs. I'll now introduce the moderator of today's event, Nancy Naomi Carlson. Nancy Naomi Carlson's translation of Kal Torabuli's Cargo Hold of Stars, Hulitude, published by Siegel Books in 2021, won the Oxford Weidenfeld Translation Prize. Her second full-length poetry collection, as well as her co-translation of Wendy Guerra with Esperanza Hope Snyder, were noted in the New York Times. Piano in the Dark, also published by Siegel, her third poetry collection arrives this October. Take it away, Nancy. Thank you, Alex, so much for that lovely introduction. And thank you, Alex, for being part of the ground floor of the series of Women in Translation way back when, um, when it was in person. And then pandemic came and we moved it to virtual Zoom. And then we brought in authors from all over the, the world. and. This tonight is very, very special in that we've never had an evening women in, women in Translation event. And we wanted to be fair to all parts of the globe and not make our, our Chinese and, and Japanese and Asian and South Asian and rest of that part of the world suffer so much. And we hope that um, uh, we'll continue having this as an option. Uh, we have five author translator pairs and several are emerging translators. So we're very excited to be bringing them to you. Um, we are representing languages of German, Japanese, Mandarin, Chinese, Spanish, and Tutunaku, an indigenous Spanish language. We'll follow the reading by a short Q&A as time permits. And if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box so that we can look at that once we've, we've gone through our readings. So let's begin. Our first group of readers will be translators Wendy Call and Whitney DeVos and author Cruz Salahandra Lucas Suarez. Wendy is the author of the award-winning nonfiction book, No Word for Welcome and is co-editor of the anthologies Telling True Stories and Best Literary Translations and translator of three books of poetry. Whitney is a scholar, translator, and writer. She lives in Mexico City and has received translation fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and Cornell University's Institute for Comparative Modernities. Cruz is the author of Slaxuman Papa, Las Hijas de Luna, 2021, and the first woman to publish a book in poetry in Tutunacu, an indigenous Mexican language. 
Welcome, Wendy, Whitney, and Cruz. Thank you so much, Nancy, Naomi. Thank you so much, Alex, Catherine, Esperanza, and Aliyah for supporting this event. Thank you so much to the audience for being here. We're really excited to have a chance to share these poems and translations with everyone tonight. And I'm gonna begin with a short um, kind of contextualizing statement. And then uh, I will read, uh, well then Cruz will read um, her poems in Tutunaku and um, in Spanish. And then I'll read the first two translations and then Wendy will read uh, a third uh, final translation. And so with that, I'll get started. These poems are drawn from Cruz Alejandra Lucas Juarez's debut collection of poetry, which was published in 2020 by the University of Puebla in Mexico. The book's title, Suman Papa, Las Hijas de Luno, or Daughters of Luno, references the Tutunacu belief that the moon or Papa in Tutunacu is the metaphorical father of all women. He bestows on them the gift of their womanhood as regulator of the menstrual cycle and his monthly arrival is characterized as an amorous affair. The Spanish word for moon, luna, is gendered female. In the Spanish versions of her poems, Cruz changes the gender to male, luno, to match the tutunacu perception. The first two poems that we'll read in all three languages are about luno. The third poem that we'll read is the first of a multi-part homage to a woman called Nana Tzifita, a much celebrated midwife in Cruz's home village, who was the person who delivered her as a baby. Cruz writes and publishes her, her work bilingually in Spanish and Tutunacu. Wendy and I worked primarily from the Spanish versions, collaborating directly with Cruz to bring some of the metaphorical and sonic qualities of the Tutunacu versions into, into our English translations. And the title of the first poem in English uh, is Who is Luno? Uh, in Spanish, uh, Quien es Luno? Uh, and in Tutunacu, Si ma papa. Cruz, empezamos. Este poema se llama Ti man papa. Ti man papa. Aktumi hashanat, Shkilpini akapun, Skititish la tukit, Shtatsanin gatsis ni, Skatanati, Shmakasia ninguyu, Kapsnati, Tani nalkauli yao, Shkilzukuti, Gilatamatkan. ¿Quién es Luno? Un suspiro, labio del cielo, masa para el atole. Diente de la noche, menguante garra de armadillo, página blanca para escribir el comienzo de nuestra historia. Who is Luno? A sigh, the sky's lip, masa for mixing a tole, the night's tooth, the armadillo's waning claw, a white page for writing out the opening lines of our history. Quince, está la pasquín y papá. La gmaca si minta pasquín, la cata minta la pasquín y quince. Macatunus catana, macatunu catana, la catsilla y pichitana xcapinin. Chua maxaxaya, xaxanatu a starzi. Cha, xlima cuanis, suana, la cachan y quince, cantar y quiwi, chua cantar y xanat. Mi madre es amante de Luno. Rechacé tu llegada porque eres amante de mi madre. Cada que naces y mueres, anuncias tu arribo a sus cañadas y seduces sus semillas flor. Mi padre, durante tus ausencias, sembró cuatro flores y cuatro árboles en el nido que construiste. My mother is Father Moon's lover. I rejected your arrival because you are my mother's lover. With every waxing and waning, you announce your arrival in her ravine and seduce her seed-filled flower. During your absences, my father planted four flowers and four trees in the nest that you had created.
na natsita shlimaktum la kumu la kukako la tsuchichak la kiswanta sanikosin nanash la kanish nanash lash kinkakukayan shashanato akstipun chalanga kuwa aksus katashakonit Kintili makasapamisi sa tuwani skulimasyanat. Kamatsi swang gisagit. Sa kasuta wila, sla la slaktimini chichini. Shani buskata saksawat. Stikiki sta aksputa wila palanto kasin. Ka tatantiti sa chuchuti was kasigu. Slip, slip, slayi sa titsoko slitambachi. Slakpuwang ko. Lakstak ningi wan chibwish Lakstumbulu shtantu Shtantu tsukhoi Dani shtantu pangkonit Ka Shakkas patita wulangiti Nchiyo Shaklikot namputuna Shlistakna shtakaya Nana tsirita Uno Me arrullaba En su floreada espalda Tal como las ranas Se montan una a otra Cuando a gritos invocan a la lluvia de mayo. Cuando era retoño de orquídea blanca, machacó hojas de luna en el rostro de mis pétalos para que mi atola, atole fuese el más rico. Con su cántaro tres orejas bajaba por agua al primer parpadeo del sol para luego subir por la montaña. Parecía bailar con el agua al compás de su roja cadera. Piedras verdes anhelaban ser acariciadas por sus pies desnudos. Guardaban besos en las fisuras de sus talones. Y yo la esperaba para beber el corazón de Chitacaya. Nana Sivita, one. She lulled me to sleep on her flowered shoulders, just like frogs carry their young, bringing May's rains with their croaking. When the white orchid sprouted, she crushed moon white leaves on the petals of my hands, so my atole would be the sweetest. With her three-handled jug, she went down to the river at the sun's first glimmer. Later, while climbing the mountain, she seemed to dance with the water to the rhythm of her red hips. Green rocks longed to be caressed by her bare feet, holding kisses in the cracks of her heels. As I waited to drink from Shtukayu Mountain's heart. So these poems are the very first translations of Cruz's poetry into English. And all three of them, along with uh, two other poems from this series, will be published in the September, October issue of World Literature Today. So in a couple of weeks, this is the book that they are from of Cruz Alejandra's, um, which you can actually buy on Amazon. It's Spanish and Tutunacu. And uh, felicidades Cruz, and thanks to everyone for listening. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Cruz, Wendy, and Whitney. Very exciting to hear this language. Our next pair of readers will be translator Kelly John and author Celia John Tingyi. Kelly is a writer and Chinese-English bi-directional translator working across a spectrum of genres. Her translations have appeared in the New York Times, Sign Theta, Read Paper Republic, and Journey Planet. Celia is a young writer whose work has appeared in many prestigious Chinese literary magazines. Most recently, her contemporary feminist collection, of Mountains and Snow was long listed for the 2022 Blancpain Imaginist Literary Prize. Welcome, Kelly and Celia. Thank you. Um, I have the pleasure of translating Celia Zhang Tianyi, who writes in uh, Simplified Chinese. 
So the excerpt we'll be reading from today is taken from the story Blood on the Floor, which is one of the seven stories composing her 2022 contemporary feminist novel collection of Mountain and Snow. Each story in the novel centers on a character named Lily, who has to grapple with unique personal trauma and loss while shouldering the weight imposed by sexism and misogyny on their daily lives. Lili represents both the universal and the specific experiences of women at various ages and from various backgrounds living in contemporary urban China. Um, this novel hit number one place on the 2022 Fiction Book of the Year list on the one, which is uh, Chinese Goodreads. And it was long listed for the Blanc Pain Imaginus Literary Prize for Young Emerging Sinophone Writers. Since it's in initial publication just over a year ago, it has been reprinted 10 times and sold nearly 100,000 copies to date. The content of the novel resonated especially strongly with the women readers of China across the demo uh, demographic spectrum. So in this story, Blood on the Floor, um, after her long divorced mother, Chang Le, had remarried, Li Li, a uh, young urban professional, visits her mother and her stepfather's new home for the first time. When Li Li's period abruptly came in the middle of the night, earlier than she had expected, she went to ask her mother for a supply of sanitary napkins. It was then that she found out her mother had already gone into menopause. He no longer stocked sanitary napkins in the home. Their once intimate mother-daughter bond as symbolized by their shared blood and menstruation rituals was slowly unraveling. Um, so for our reading, uh, Zhang Tianyi will read the original text in Mandarin Chinese first, and then I will read my English translation of the text. It will go by paragraph. Uh, so yes, Celia, you may begin. Okay, okay. Um, shall I begin? Um, 此后, 记住彼此的日期,给予对方不太必要的叮嘱和关怀,他们聊这些时,莉莉的父亲会专注地盯着电视机或报纸,装作没听见,不知一词。这个话题是以成年女儿的身体的虚拟延伸,一种禁忌,
they will let their words flow out more and more freely, sometimes in this direction, sometimes in a different one, but always making a concerted effort to mock, irritate, and estrange the third person in the room with the intimacy of their conversation until a soft, disquieting air has suffused the entire room and pushed him out the door. Like stubborn hands that kept rubbing at one's eyes until every brick of sand had come out of it, or relentless waves that pushed away any debris they did not wish to swallow onto the shore. 雪，神秘的雪，雪是红色印章，是细细的红线。上天用红线一样的雪把它捆扎成礼物，送到他母亲怀中。即使丈夫暴力无能，令人痛苦，只要想到这件礼物，母亲就不去责怪命运。Blood, mystical blood, was a red seal, a thin red thread, the thread that the divine powers of the universe had used to wrap Lily up like a gift and deliver her into her mother Chang'e's arms. Even though Chang'e's impulsive, ill-tempered, and incompetent husband had caused her much pain and grief, but just thinking about that precious gift of a daughter、uh, soothed Chang'e's tattered heart and made her willingly forgive fate. 他曾那么喜欢这件伴随痛楚的秘密，它只属于他和母亲。世界上所有别人都无法参与，无法分享。他当初就乘着这样的红色潮水，从肉体的下戏中滑进世界，从母亲的盼望里跨入现实。某种程度上，我们活在与亲爱的人共享的部分里。那有一种光，让你认清所有最深处的东西，并滋养真正的快乐。Lily had once so cherished the blood red secret that accompanied her monthly cramps. It belonged to her and her mother alone. Nobody else in the world could partake in that secret. To think that she had once ridden on such a red tide at the very dawn of her life, slipping into the world through the fissure in Chang'e's flesh, crossing from her mother's dream into reality. In a way, each of us live inside the parts and pieces that we share with our loved ones. A light dwells there, through which we can see all that's deep within, and where true joy finds its rich nourishment. Thank you. Thank you. Both、uh, the blood red secret. I can see how this novel sold a hundred thousand copies. This is what I heard. Congratulations. Our next pair of readers will be Regan Meese and author Gianna Rivera. Regan is an editorial assistant in New York. Her translations, fiction, and reviews have appeared in No Man's Land, the Asymptote Blog, the Cleveland Review of Books, and elsewhere. Gianna lives and works in Zurich. A freelance curator, author, and cultural journalist. Her work deals with intimacy in public spaces and the connections between elephants and women. Welcome, Regan and Gianna. Thank you very much for your introduction, Nancy Naomi, and thank you to Pen America for putting this reading together. I know Gianna and I are both very excited to be taking part.、Um, so I first read Gianna's piece. Incidents of Everyday Elephants in a German language literary magazine last summer, and I kept thinking in the days、um, and weeks that followed of the different entries that make up this piece. There were nine entries in the original story, and all of a sudden I found myself putting more and more energy into really observing the world around me, and I began noticing patterns and themes in my daily life.、Um, the episodes in her piece are at times funny and lighthearted, sometimes whimsical, and at times they are deeply, deeply moving. Um, they made me feel curious, connected, and excited about even the most quotidian things. So I'm very happy to be sharing them with an English language audience this evening. And Gianna, do you have a bit to say about them as well before we begin? Thanks a lot.、Um, the four episodes we will read are part of a larger writing project about the elephants in my everyday life. So they appear large and heavy in unexpected and everyday places and scenes. By elephants, I mean not only those in the zoo, but also in our language, on our clothes, 
in the streets at night and in our heads. In this collection of semi-fictional episodes, these observation, observations themselves are brought into focus. In terms of content, they revolve around the inner and outer gazes that brush women's bodies every day. Um, and I guess I will start to read. 13. März 2021, Matriarchat. Die Autorin Maggie Nelson schreibt in ihrem Buch Die Argonauten, dass sie in ihrer Schwangerschaft trotz allem überrascht war, dass ihr Körper einen männlichen Körper hervorbringen konnte. Später lese ich auf einem Blog für Elefantenfans, dominante Elefantinnen haben eher weiblichen Nachwuchs. Der Text hinterfragt die biologische These, dass bei Säugetieren nur die Männchen durch ihre XY-Geschlechtschromosomen für die Geschlechtsteile der Nachkommen verantwortlich sind. Denn Weibchen würden ja mehr Energie in die Aufzucht ihrer Nachkommen investieren und so sei es ihnen bestimmt nicht egal, ob sie ein weibliches oder ein männliches Jungtier großziehen. Ich frage mich, ob das etwas mit dem Matriarchat zu tun hat, in dem Elefanten leben. So werden als Vergleich dazu in patriarchisch geprägten Regionen der Menschenwelt übermäßig viele weibliche Fluten abgetrieben, da sich Familien männlichen Nachkommen wünschen. Ob die Geschlechtsteile eines Fötus Zufall sind oder von außen beeinflusst werden können, wird auch in diversen Fernsehsitcoms verhandelt. Unter anderem so. M will keine Tochter bekommen, weil er Angst hat, dass sie von Männern sexualisiert wird. Er bekommt Tipps von seinem Vater, der wie sein Großvater nur Söhne gezeugt hat. Vermeide Zitronen, iss einen gelegten Hering, zunke deine Hoden in Eiswasser und habe Sex in Richtung Norden. Eine andere Theorie besagt, dass X-Chromosomspermien langsamer als Y-Chromosomspermien seien, dafür aber länger überleben würden. So hätte man bessere Chancen auf ein Mädchen, wenn der Zeugungsakt kurz vor dem Eisprung stattfindet. 13th of March 2021, Matriarchy. The author Maggie Nelson writes in her book, The Argonauts, that during her pregnancy, despite everything, she was surprised her own body could bear a masculine body. Later, on a blog for elephant fans, I read, dominant female elephants are more likely to have female offspring. The blog post contradicts the biological theory that a male parent's sex chromosomes are the only thing responsible for the genitals of mammal offspring. It suggests that Because the female invests so much more energy into her cub's upbringing, she certainly wouldn't be indifferent to whether she would be raising a male or female. I wonder if this has something to do with the matriarchy elephants live in. I could make a comparison to the more patriarchal regions of our human world, where a disproportionate number of female fetuses are aborted since family wants, families want male descendants. This question of whether a fetus's genitals could be influenced by the outside comes up in all sorts of places, sitcoms even, like this, for example. M doesn't want to have a daughter because he's scared she'll be sexualized by men. He gets some tips from his father, who, like his grandfather, has only fathered sons. Avoid lemons, eat pickled herring, dip your testicles into ice water, and have sex in the direction north. According to another theory, X-chromosome sperm are slower than Y-chromosome sperm, so they should be able to survive longer. If that's the case, you'd have better chances of a girl when the act of procreation takes place just before ovulation. 19. April 2021. Brüste. Unter der Maske bilden sich Schweißtröpfchen auf meiner Oberlippe. Ich versuche, sie wegzulecken und hinterlasse eine unangenehm kühle Speichelspur, die ich nun mit der Hand durch die Maske hindurch trocknen wische. Ich warte mit zwischen hochgehobenen Kindern an der Absperrung zum Elefantengehege. Ein Kalb saugt aus den vollen Brüsten zwischen den Vorderbeinen seiner Mutter. Der Anblick irritiert mich da ich kein Euter wie bei Kühen erwartet hatte. The 19th of April, 2021. Breasts. Under my mask, beads of sweat form on my upper lip. I try to lick them away and leave behind an uncomfortably cool trail of saliva I have to wipe dry with my hand through my mask. I'm standing at the barrier of the elephant enclosure, surrounded on all sides by children lifted high into the air. A calf suckles from the full breasts between its mother's front legs. I'm irritated at the sight, Irritated that I had expected an udder like a cow's. 6. Juni 2021. Blau. Hannah sagt, dein Name verbinde ich mit der Farbe Blau. 
Eva sagt, blau ist eine Elefantenfarbe. The 6th of June, 2021, blue. Hannah says, I associate your name with the color blue. Eva says, blue is an elephant color. 11. September 2021, Schwanensee. Glynis sitzt auf dem weiter vom Pult entfernten Bett im Bahnhofshotel im Obwaldnischen Gesuh. Ich sitze auf dem Stuhl und schaue ihr aus dem Augenwinkel zu, wie sie in ihrem Koffer wühlt. Das Zimmer hat einen graublauen Standteppich mit kleinen gelben Punkten, auf dem die zwei dunklen Bettrahmen stehen, die wir scheu 20 cm auseinandergezogen haben. Glynis ist eine zarte, fast verschwindende Frau. Ihre Nase fällt an der Spitze steil nach unten ab, ihr Haar ist blondgrau. Ich frage sie, welche Performance sie morgen zeigen wird. Daraufhin erzählt sie mir von sich. Sie war 20 Jahre lang Balletttänzerin am Opernhaus Zürich. Jetzt nicht mehr. Jetzt sei sie alt. Sie habe bestimmt 40 Mal den Schwanensee getanzt, nie die Schwanenkönigin. Ich erz sie erzählt mir, dass Tänzerinnen mit offenen Füßen früher Kalbfleisch in ihre Schützenschuhen legten. Fleisch auf Fleisch lindert die Schmerzen. Manchmal, wenn sie einen sehr schlechten Tag hatte, schmiss sie die Proben hin, fuhr mit dem Zug nach Basel und ging in den Zoo. Da war ein wunderbares Café zwischen dem Elefantengehege und den Menschenaffen. Es war wunderschön im kolonialen Stil gebaut und mit Lianen behangen. Es sei gewesen, als wäre sie nicht nach Basel, sondern direkt in Serengeti gereist. Als sie Jahre später nach Basel zog und voller Vorfreude war auf dieses Gefühl von Fremdheit, war das Café verschwunden. The 11th of September 2021, Swan Lake. In the Gisville Station Hotel, Linus sits on the corner of the bed farthest from the door. I sit in the chair and watch her out of the corner of my eye how she burrows into her suitcase. The room has blue-gray wall-to-wall -wall carpeting with constellations of little yellow dots on which there are two dark bed frames we've shyly pulled 20 centimeters apart from one another. Glynis is a delicate, nearly transparent woman. The bridge of her nose slopes steeply. Her hair is gray blonde. I ask her which performance she'll be presenting tomorrow. That's when she opens up. She was a ballet dancer at the Zurich Opera House for 20 years but not any longer now that she's old. She has danced in Swan Lake at least 40 times, never as the Swan Queen. She tells me that open-toed dancers used to put veal in their point shoes, meat against meat to mitigate the pain. Sometimes when she'd had an especially bad day, she'd toss rehearsal aside, take the train to Basel and visit the zoo. There was a wonderful cafe between the elephant enclosure and the great apes. It was lovely colonial style, all draped in jungle vines. When she was there, it was as if she had never traveled to Basel, but rather taken a train directly into the Serengeti. When, years later, she moved to Basel, full of anticipation for that specific feeling of foreignness, the cafe had disappeared. Thank you very much. Thank you. I did not know that blue is an elephant color and that you put veal in toe shoes. And if you want to have a boy, you avoid lemons. I think I got that right. Thank you. Thank you for this reading, beginning and Diana. Our next pair of readers will be translator Heather Davis and Kauri Fujino. Heather is a translator and writer living in Tokyo. Her short story translations have appeared in magazines such as Conjunctions, Chicago Review, the Paris Review, and it just came out today in Guernica. Kauri is a Japanese writer known for reimagining genre tropes with literary flair. In 2023, Pushkin Press published her Akutagaiwa prize-winning novella, Nails and Eyes, translated by Kendall Heitzman. Welcome, Heather and Kauri. Thank you very much. I'll let Fujino-san start us off with a Jiko Shokai. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kaori Fujino, a fiction writer from Japan. I have published about 10 books in Japanese. Uh, one of these books has recently been published in English titled Nails and Eyes, uh, which was translated by uh, Kendall Heitzman. Also, my short story, 
Quiet Night was published in Galonica, translated by Heather San. <laughs> ありがとうございます。Thank you for having me here tonight. ありがとうございます。Thank you very much, Fujina san. And I'm Heather D. Davis.、Um, I was born in America, but have spent the last four years in Japan.、Um, and I'm continuing to take classes at Tokyo University and trying to get better and better at translating. But today,、um, we're going to actually be presenting、um, part of the story, Quiet Night, that was recently published.、Uh, so I think that link will be thrown in there. So if you want to pull up and find us and read along, feel free. But in this short story,、uh, the protagonist is a woman named Chikako, and she's been hearing some strange voices at night that seem to be coming from the kitchen hood over her stove. So she has decided to investigate these strange, mysterious voices, and she's calling in sick to work. And that is where we'll begin. Fujina san, o n e g a i s h i m a s ほんやくいらんしょうをげんごとないようでぶんるいしほんやくしゃのせんもんぶんやごとにふりわけてのあいているものにはっちゅうをかけるちょくせつせきにいってだしんしたりメールをしたりでんわをかけたりするほんやく
I know this phrase, that one and this one. I've seen them all spelled out so many times. I know this. I know this. It's the same natural ease of reading Japanese, the same warm recognition of hearing her own name. Shikako becomes convinced that she's basically read the texts, but in reality, they're far beyond her grasp. She would lose to a single English sentence. Chikako's I know this was simply just, I've seen this somewhere before. The meaning of those little lines of letters, that's what she lacked. From time to time, she would even crack open a dictionary herself. Right, right, that's what it was, she'd nod, and promptly forget it all, as if forgetting was just another part of the job. レンジフードの前に丸椅子を持ってきて過ごす。多分近くは知らないが。外の Seemed to have caught a bad case of the flu, Chikako explains, forcing a weak cough. With the time she has carved out for herself, Chikako elects to sit on a bar stool in front of the stove. The TV stays off. No music. Heating. Off. There's a chill to the air, so Chikako puts on a trench coat and wraps a wool muffler around her neck. Sitting on the bar stool, Chikako stares up at the kitchen hood. The stainless steel part finished in opaque gray that she's glaring at is called a rectifier, though Chikako probably doesn't know that. Chikako holds her breath, listening. From the balcony window, the sounds of a car, a motorbike, a bicycle, the dun, a basketball on the pavement. Voices greeting each other, chit-chatting, the wind blowing, people talking on their phones as they pass by. All of those sounds, but there, leaking from the hollow space at the edge of the rectifier, separate from any outdoor activity, Chikako distinguishes a chorus of many voices. She can hear them. She can hear them. She climbs atop the bar stool and sticks her ears close, so close the duct looks like a hat she's trying on for size. Unbelievable, she thinks. These people have been keeping up a lively conversation during the daytime, too. Chikako wa kiku. Shiranai gengo janai. と近くは判断する。Chikako listens. It's not a foreign language, she decides. She could just about understand them, but not quite. She can't hear them perfectly. The voices are all talking over each other. That's why she can't understand. And they sound so far away. Just a little longer, she thinks. I definitely know this. The woman must have nerves of steel. After staring at those lines of letters every day and facing the same bitter disappointment, she's still at it. Chikako doesn't learn. She'll never learn. I'm frankly amazed. Chikako breathes slow, deep breaths. 
The air is filled with these voices, dissolved into tiny particles. If she just breathes in enough of the particles, surely she'll be able to understand their language. Those strange voices fill up her body, turn her red blood crimson. Thank you very much. Thank you, Heather and, and Kauri, and that image of translators hunched over their desks and their eyes dilated when they know they know it, but maybe they don't understand it. That's perfect. Oh, time has flown. We are up to our last pair of readers, and they will be translator Faris Gander and author Jeanette Mosano Clariond. Although Faris translates many Latin American and Spanish writers, his focus has been on a generation of Mexican women who came of age around the Tlatelolco massacre in Mexico City. Mexican poet and translator Jeanette is the author of many books, including Cuerpo de Mi Sangre, the 2022 Pilar Fernandez Labrador Award winner. She lives in Nueva León. Welcome, Boris and Jeanette. As a brief introduction, I should say that uh, Jeanette Lozano Clarion is a prolific Mexican poet, and she's the recipient of more notable awards than I should enumerate here. Her work is well known in Spain and Latin America, and her books have been translated into many languages. Even in her collaboration with Mexican artist Victor Ramirez, which includes a poetic sequence written at the beginning of the US war with Iraq, Carrion's work is characterized by its painterly nature, its emotional intensity, and its intense sensuality. Throughout her many books, the themes of trauma and a spiritual struggle to rise above it, a struggle which involves finding a language to articulate the complexities of world, body, wound, eros, and the nuances of feeling come clear. Formerly, her books range from one-line sequences to prose poems to long-lined poems. She's also written in Cuaderno de Chihuahua, Chihuahua Notebook, a prose autobiogra autobiography of her childhood and her poetic calling. Quieres decir algo? Uh, thank you. I just want to thank you, Forrest and, and Pen Club. Thank you. Okay. Um, we're going to, uh, oh, a few of these poems uh, will uh, appear on Ron Slate's uh, On the Seawall. We're going to start with a poem in English so that we can end with um, by hearing Jeanette's voice. Naked, I waited for you. The dust was almost audible, light beating into interstices of the Venetian blind. As you waited the arrival of the galley, glitter floated above the waves. We rowed to shore. Did the boat arrive or leave? Almost everything glowed, almost everything. Where was the willow's reflection in the pool? The bird went on singing, despite the prediction. A quiet saffron wind settled into the meadow that night. It was you entering the room, you passing through the air. Naked, I waited for you, the bathtub brimmed with desire. The tree leaning, the soft dampness of touching tiles, a ceramic light falling over our bodies. Then the rest of the flame, blind, we sank into the linen, into a friction that completes the abandonment, as when swans must return to the ice. Desnuda te esperé, apenas si oí el polvo. Latía la luz en los intersticios de la veneciana, y tú esperabas la llegada de la galera. Flotaba el brillo en el oleaje, remos a la orilla. Llegó o se fue la embarcación. Casi todo resplandecía, casi todo. 
¿Por qué el sauce no se reflejó en la alberca? El ave sí cantó a pesar del vaticinio. Callado viento de azafrán, habitaría esa noche la pradera. Eras tú entrando en la habitación, tú atravesando el aire. Desnuda te esperé. La bañera rebosaba deseo, el árbol inclinado, la humedad suave del tacto, los azulejos, la luz de la cerámica en los cuerpos, luego el reposo de la llama. Ciegos nos hundimos en el hino, roces que colman el abandono cuando al hielo regresan los cisnes. And from Cuaderno de Chihuahua, Mina 1004. Arder, yo vi a mi abuela arder. Agosto, Chihuahua, 1963. Ella ardió, su fuera y su dentro, ardió en la calle Mina 1004. Vi a mi padre envolverla en una sábana. El colchón ardía, las cortinas, la alfombra, su vestido ennegrecieron. Todo lo recogió. No hagan ruido. Su madre está cansada. Lo vi de luto esa tarde de agosto con su corbata negra. La recogió. Ceniza y llanto recogió. El humo de la abuela en el zaguán. Las tías sorbiendo ásperos los grumos del café. Había que borrar lo oscuro que dolía, disolver la sal, el llanto, abrazarse y sofocar el temblor del viaje, escuchar a Polanca y en la falta de pulso, rayar el disco de 45 revoluciones por minuto. Por instantes vivía, por instantes todo fue púrpura, la mujer, el cansancio, las frondas de los álamos, después el vidrio, el vidrio en el cedro, el rostro quemado bajo el humo. Ella, mi madre, también ardió. En lágrimas su sonrisa apagada. Arréglame el pelo, me dijo. Déjame salir a ver si ya está seca la ropa. Tuve miedo de que sus pasos lentos no volvieran de la tersura de la hoja, del sigiloso carcomer, del reseco peso de la hiedra ya sin muro, del florero en la cocina sin flores. De ese cuarto ciego con su muerte tuve miedo, de mí misma y el filtrarse del viento que se llevaba el polvo de los sicomoros. 1004 Mina Street Burning. I saw my grandmother burning. August, Chihuahua, 1963. She burned without and within. Burned at 1004 Mina Street. I watched my father wrap her in a sheet, the mattress on fire, the curtains, the carpet, her dress blackened. He gathered everything up. Keep quiet. Your mother's exhausted. I saw him in mourning that August afternoon in his black tie. He gathered her up, ashes and weeping. He gathered it all up. Grandmothers smoke in the hallway, the ants sipping bitter, their lumps of coffee. I had to rub away the stinging darkness to dissolve the salt, the weeping, to embrace and suffocate the tremor of passage listening to Paul Anka, and when the beat stopped, scratching the 45 RPM record. For a few moments, she lived. For a few moments, everything went purple. The woman, the fatigue, the poplar fronds. Afterwards, the viewing glass, the glass plate in her cedar casket, her visage burned beneath the smoke. She, my mother, burned as well. Tears extinguished her smile. Fix my hair, she told me. Let me go outside to see if the clothes are dry. I was afraid of the thought that her slow footsteps wouldn't return, of the leaf's smoothness, of the stealthy gnawing, of the dry weight of ivy without its supporting wall 
of the vase in the kitchen minus its flowers. Of that blind room, its death, I was afraid of myself and of the wind that swept up and filtered the dust of the sycamores. And um, uh, we're going to finish with this short poem from a different book. Beyond your skin, even deeper than your bones, the pain, the pain. Mouth of this song, you're the mirror. Más allá de tu piel, más hondo que tus huesos, el dolor, el dolor. Boca de este canto, espejo eres. From todo antes de la noche, everything before the night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fari. Thank you, Jeanette. Um, you got me in the beginning, very steamy about the bathtub brimmed with desire. That's Jeanette. <laughs> so these are our readers, and thank you to the readers for a stunning reading with voices in so many languages, gripping reading that held my attention to each word. And we do have time for questions. I see that we had one question that was in the chat. Um, and I have a few others in case we don't have any more, but please put your questions in the chat. This is for everybody from Sarah Hanneberg. Can you talk about the discussions between writers and translators? What is the process like? So the, the discussions that translators and writers have and what this process is of bringing words in one language into another language. Feel free to jump in. So Jeanette, start us off, please. I um I want to thank you, Nancy, and all of the team and uh, the other poets and writers that are here with me, and especially I would like to thank Forrest. He's done a wonderful job, and as you heard him, he's a wonderful reader. So one of the things that is important to capture, I believe, is the music, and by the way he read, by the way Forrest read like faster sometimes and slower at the times that is that is something that I didn't discuss with him but what I can see from his reading is that he kept the music and poetry was born as music and it keeps on being music so that's very important to me and as for the questions Yes, Forrest and I discussed some some things, and I believe it is important to discuss them when there are doubts. Yes. Forrest, did you want to add something? Just my worst experiences with other translators are when the translator never asks a question. Um, I, I like the dialogue which you can only have with living writers, with dead writers, you're on your own. And um, and with Jeanette, um, because her English is very good, um, uh, it's it's been a really easy process of asking her about certain um, syntactical things that she does that I find um, uh, extraordinary. Thank you. And um, my, my backup people are telling me also for this question, Wendy and Whitney and Cruz, very interesting to hear what you have to say about a process with so many cooks in the kitchen being able to produce a delicious meal. Yeah. Cruz, quisieran saber tu respuesta a esta pregunta acerca de cómo es el proceso de traducción y um, sobre todo como son poemas ya bilingües, cómo es 
platicar con nosotras acerca del proceso de hacer llegar los poemas al inglés. Si And the three responder. languages too. Yeah, I said that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. That's for Forrest. This is now for Wendy and Whitney. Okay. ¿Quieres comentar Cruz? Cruz. Sí. Eh, bueno. Eh, la mayoría de los escritores en lenguas originarias de México eh, somos, nos autotraducimos. Eh, escribimos en nuestra lengua materna y lo trabajamos, trabajamos la traducción para pasarlo al español. Y es desde niña yo soy bilingüe, entonces domino las dos lenguas, el totonaco y el español. Y al momento de crear un poema, eh, trato de pensar siempre en totonaco primero y después hacer una traducción literal al español. Eh, llegando al español, eh, trato de que sea un poema bien estructurado con todo lo que pide el español, con la poética del español. Y si hay algo que no me gustó, eh, si algo me gustó en español y quiero pasarlo al totonaco, lo puedo hacer. Eh, lo puedo, puedo pasar una palabra del español al totonaco. Eh, con tal de que el poema quede eh, muy bien en totonaco y también en español. Voy a traducir al inglés lo que dijiste, Cruz, y luego hay, hay otra parte de, de la pregunta que tiene que ver con, para ti, cómo era el proceso de traducir del, um, de las versiones originales al inglés con, con Whitney y conmigo. Um, what she said was actually about her own translation process, and so maybe she'll have more to say about the translation into English, um, and I'm going to summarize what she said, so I apologize for that. Uh, she says that um, like most indigenous language uh, writers, poets who are working um, at least in, in Mexico and in Latin America, um, they self-translate their work from the indigenous language into Spanish. She says that she's been um, fully bilingual in both languages, Tutunacu and Spanish since childhood. Um, but at the moment of creating those poems where the poems begin, she really tries to think about the Tutunacu first and to make a poem that really works in Tutunacu. Then she does what she calls a literal translation into Spanish. Um, and she says that then she's really thinking about Spanish poetics and what will make this poem work in Spanish. Um, so a different, uh, you know, cultural and poetic context. And sometimes something comes out um, that is a little different in Spanish than it was in the first Tutunacu version. And so then she'll go back to the Tutunacu in hopes of, um, getting what it, perhaps getting what she liked in that Spanish translation back into um, the first version of the poem. ¿Quieres comentar acerca del proceso con nosotras? Sí, nuestra forma de trabajar la traducción al inglés, en tanto Wendy y Whitney nos reunimos y eh, trabajaron primero una traducción, un borrador y tuvimos nuestra reunión y me preguntaron acerca de algunos conceptos eh, muy específicos del totonaco hay, unos, hay unas palabras que no las traduje al español por ejemplo eh, Xtacaya, que es un nombre el nombre de una montaña o más los nombres de lugares que no se pueden traducir y en inglés se pasaron esos mismos términos. Y también trabajamos con audios, eh, con la musicalidad de los poemas de Totonaco al inglés y del español al inglés. Y eh, fue un proceso eh, muy bonito. Eh, son mis primeros poemas traducidos al inglés y estoy muy contenta de que puedan eh, también escucharlo. 
y eh, ese fue el proceso, eh, pues estoy contenta. ¿Hay editoriales de México que publican libros de poesía en, en Tutunaco? Están. <laughs> This is yeah. um, from the University of Puebla. Wow. Yeah. Um, so if I can just translate what she said before, it leaves my mind. Um, but that's a great question about publishers of indigenous um, lenguas originarias in, in Mexico. Um, so she said that um, the way of our way of working, and I mean that by our, the three of us, Cruz and Whitney and me, uh, was that Whitney and I created a draft translation. Um, and I guess I'll, I'm going to put a parenthesis of my own in here in, in that, as you probably heard from the introductions, um, everyone else who's on this call who's being translated speaks and reads English and Cruz does not. And that's a pretty big difference in a translation process. She just has to trust us in the end. Uh, so we created our English draft, Whitney and I, we passed them back and forth about three times. Then we brought Cruz into the process. Um, we had a Zoom call. Um, And we talked about the concepts in um, in Tutunaku that were in these poems, cultural concepts in the poems um, and how to get them um, into English or what to do with them. And so Cruz mentioned specifically the words that she chooses to leave in Tutunaku in the Spanish versions um, and how can we Um, convey, you know, some of what's behind them in our English translations. Uh, and that was one phase of the work. And then the next phase of the work was Cruz um, made audio um, recordings of her reading these poems um, in Tutunaku, since Whitney and I do not um, read or understand that language. And so then we had this audio material that we could use um, to work on the musicality, which it, as Jeanette said, is very important. Uh, and then at the end of, of her answer, um, Guru said that she this was the first time her work has appeared in English. So she's um, really um, happy about that and thinks it was a really um, positive process for her and that she's happy to have these poems um, in English. And then I'll just add that, um, Since these are the first ones, we could pick the ones that we felt confident about getting the concepts into English. And there are half of the draft translations that um, Whitney and I did are actually still kind of cooking on the stove because we decided that they were um, harder and needed more time. <laughs> I think um, for Gina, since they also had a comment, if that's okay, yeah. not translate. <laughs> それ。はい、あの、えっと、私はあの、あんまり英語がわかっていないので、あの、大体もう翻訳者さんにお任せしていて、で、翻訳者さんから質問いただいたら、それに返答すると回答するという程度です。あの、ただあの、先月あの、
for me definitely I feel actually this story we didn't really talk too much beforehand I actually started translating it a couple years ago and it was a long process to see it published and at the time uh, Fujino-san was working with Kendall Heitzman to be uh, busy publishing her first full-length English uh, novel and so I also was doing it a bit blind but I was able to ask other um, native speakers questions about the uh, the any part that I had a bit of confusion about and something I've noticed a lot is that sometimes there are things that in the original language are perhaps a bit um, vague in the sense that in that language, often, especially like gestures moving through space, where they could be interpreted one way or the other. And that's not necessarily you not understanding the language. It just is the same as, you know, reading something in English and not being quite sure, you know, where someone's standing in the room or what's happening. But sometimes to translate something, you almost need to make a decision whether one isn't made in the original language. And so whenever I make one of those decisions, I always want to make sure I'm consulting, if not the author, then a native speaker to make sure I'm not adding something that doesn't exist, but that I'm adding something that makes it easy to read in English and smooth. Thank you. And Regan, did you want to jump in here? Sure. So um, I, like I briefly mentioned earlier, I just came across Gianna's um, short story, her piece, very organically reading a literary magazine um, while I was traveling in Germany. And because it stuck with me, I decided I really wanted to kind of practice and try my hand. I had just taken a literary translation course um, and I wanted to, you know, try my hand at a translation of her work um, and see what I could do. And then I ended up finding kind of cold emailing Gianna and saying, you know, I loved your piece so much. I worked on it a bit. Um, and she didn't think I was crazy. And so she answered my email and we Zoomed and we got to know each other a little bit. Um, and we worked through a couple parts of the piece. Um, and it was, yeah, a really wonderful, wonderful process. And yeah, she's been immensely helpful um, and very, I hope, happy to work with me as well. Yes, um, also what Kaori, I hope I, uh, I pronounced the name rightly, um, said before, it's so interesting what you learn about your own writing if somebody else in another language is trying to really understand what you mean with this word and why you chose this so it was a wonderful experience also and i also have to say the texts that we read today they are a bit they're an older version of what's here right now so they were also the translations were important for the process of the texts how they are now. And I was just going to tack on to your great answer, a question in the chat uh, uh, from Alexander Tikau, I think is how he pronounces it. Um, I, I have to ask him later. Uh, for you, Gianna, about uh, what initially inspired the idea of elephants as a central motif of the book? Hmm. I just, at some point, I realized that in my everyday life here in Switzerland, I see more elephants than cows. And this just <laughs> did something with me. And I also tried to understand where these elephants come from, what their stories are. And then I went with a friend and she's a teacher. I went with her and her um, school kids to the zoo. And I haven't been to the zoo since a long, long time. And I was standing in this elephant um, cage thingy. And I heard two guys talking about the breasts of the elephant in a very mean way. And then I tried to understand that there is something with this male gaze that goes over species. So then I try and try to connect the elephants more of the with them women and also trying to kind of find connections from the matriarchy and the patriarchy and so this went into a bigger project about elephants and women and the connections thank you and we have not heard from kelly and celia um Thank you to the audience too for being here. Uh, 我和Kelly之前没有见过,我们是住在两个国家。Kelly其实是我的读者,他喜欢我的小说,然后跟我联系,就提出想要把我的小说译成英文。Mm -hmm. 
，嗯，因为他有自己的，他有自己的主业，所以他是用嗯零碎的时间来做翻译，嗯，啊，后来我慢慢发现我们有更多的共同点，比如我们都是嗯一个小女孩的母亲，我们还都喜欢王尔德，这说明。嗯，他他喜欢我的小说也不是偶然的。那么我的小说目前在英文世界还没有嗯别的一本，所以嗯非常感谢凯莉，嗯成为了我的第一篇小说的英文译者。OK， 所以啊 ，Celia is just saying sort of the how we kind of got to know each other. So it started as、uh, me finding this novel to read, and then I was so drawn to it, and、uh, Maybe I should just reach out to her and and see if she will be okay with me translating some of that.、Um, and then so yeah, I called,、uh, contacted her on social media, and、uh, yeah, she replied to me and was very positive about that. So,、um, so this is probably like this is her first work to be translated into English.、Uh, although I did eventually、uh, translate uh, another、uh, story from one of her other books, and that was. But this was the story that I first started translating,、um, and then、uh, we did not know each other before. But recently, I went on a trip to China, and we actually met up, and we had a very good conversation, and found out that we are actually alike in many ways.、Um, we had common interests, like you know, in terms of like you know our reading interests, and also we share our favorite author, Oscar Wilde. So yeah, like there's a lot of connections between us. So. So it kind of explained why we also connected a lot through her work. So it was a very interesting process.、Um, in terms of the actual like translation process itself,、um, I did not really consult her very much, especially in the first stage. Like I just kind of did my own translation, and if there were questions that I had, like if there were some、uh, places that I didn't feel clear about, or if there was Perhaps some logical inconsistency, then I would ask her, and she would clarify for me.、Uh, so yes, so I'm hearing、um, from from our emerging translators and、uh, from everybody really about cold emailing. So if you find an author that you really like, just cold email them and see what they say.、Um, I want to go back to a question from the chat for Celia and Kelly. One of our audience members says, "Can you discuss the tone and the theme of mother-daughter intimacy in the novel? The tone and the theme of mother-daughter intimacy." Um, 要讨论这个母亲和女儿的问题，是不是 ，Kelly？ 就说他嗯，想就是那个嗯。就是他这种之间的这种感情的这种基调，还有这种主题，就是之间的这种。Okay. 嗯，呃，我这篇小说想讨论的是，即使我们在世界上最亲密的人，也有一天会疏远。那么，在所有最亲密的关系里面，都埋藏着嗯最疼痛的那个未来。就是这个是我们嗯，可每个人都肯定需要面对的，就是最亲密的人渐渐离你远去。嗯，这个是人生的一个。So,、um, despite there being a level of intimacy between everyone, like you know, you and your loved ones, for example, mother and daughter,、uh, there always comes a time when people grow distant, and there is a pain buried in that intimacy. Always, so、uh, throughout the story, trying to reflect that sort of that universal kind of situation where,、uh, with intimacy, there comes also pain and separation. 嗯，即使母亲和女儿的关系是用血来联系的，但是当，但是即使这种血的联系，当母亲的当母亲的月经结束，嗯，这个血的联系也会也会也会也会也会也会断裂。嗯 ，Yeah, so for example, in the story, blood was basically the connection between mother and daughter. Uh, but even the blood, like in in that sense, ends because the mother. Her、uh, her menstrual cycles end when she reaches menopause. So that relationship, even though there's that connection, it becomes lost at some stage of the relationship.、Um, so. Thank you. I want to ask one more question before we wrap up. 
because we, we have had three emerging translators and I think we have emerging translators in our audience. For everybody, feel free to jump in. One piece of advice for an emerging translator, either about finding someone to translate or the big question, getting finding a publisher. Everyone's smiling. I suppose I can start us off if that's okay. Thanks. So. Um, I, I was translating for my author before I jumped in, but um, definitely, yes, I've only actually, my first short story publications were actually from Spanish and I was actually uh, lucky enough to receive some guidance from Forrest Gander, who's here with us today when he was my professor in university. So he kind of set me on this path and having those sort of mentor figures definitely is hugely helpful because actually he was able to put me in contact with my first author. But I think within that stage of finding an author and choosing someone to translate and emailing them, well, definitely cold email, emailing or Twitter DMing can be very helpful. It, I think it is important to decide when you're choosing which author to go for. Um, if you choose like a very famous author who's been translated before, they probably already have translators they're working with, or they might be a bit more hesitant to work with an untested translator. Uh, so really, I encourage you to read widely in your work and kind of read things beyond just what has been translated before, or what's the most popular works from the language, and really try to find an author that speaks with a voice that uh, you feel you could um, replicate in a way or is somehow maybe close to yours. Um, or that you're just excited to work with. And an author that perhaps has not been translated before, or not very well known. And if possible, getting into touch with them before you start translating, if you're very serious about publishing, is very important. You know, translating takes a lot of time and energy and effort. So instead of, you know, spending all that and translating a whole novella and then finding out, oh, the rights have already been sold or, oh, the author is not interested in working with me and having that heartbreak asking ahead of time and kind of being able to then again perhaps even work with the author during the process can be hugely fulfilling and also just a really exciting and one of the best parts of translation so that would be my advice other translators advice i would say share your work as often as possible. Um, for me, the process of translation, I think almost every project that I have translated um, has felt collaborative in some way, whether it's working with the editor and answering their questions that come up. But also just even before that process, many times I exchange work with a fellow translator um, to, to see their read on, um, the work that I've done, but also places where I'm running into um, challenges in conveying uh, something in English that is very clear to me in, in Spanish, um, but because of cultural differences or linguistic um, limitations uh, can be particularly hard to render uh, in, in English. And so uh, I think one of the most rewarding parts of translation for me has been um, the relationships, the collaborations um, I've uh, made through sharing my work with other translators. You know, Colin Regan. Something that I really enjoyed about the process was just, and that I think is important, is reading um, publications that, you know, publish translated work that you enjoy reading. Um, like Heather said, reading widely, finding voices that interest you um, in English translation and also in your source language um, is really important. Seeing what other translators are active, um, to second what Whitney said, and building a network, sharing your work, um, and, and really engaging with the community around you, I think opens doors and shows you opportunities that you might not have expected. So, um, I mean, I'm still 
in the process of trying to interest publishers uh, in uh, Celia's work. Uh, but the first step I thought um, we would take is to try to get it published in the literary journals uh, that accept translated work. Comparatively more easy, and it does give more exposure to the work itself. And if you know, you know, say an editor or someone reads the journal and finds the work, they might be more interested in the book. So after, so uh, yeah, I think that that would be our strategy. I hope it works <laughs> for the future. Uh, and when you... oh, Kelly, Bart, jump in. Just uh, Kelly's. Um... You know, because the magazines can be really a community themselves. For for me, Asymptote has been a great turn on for lots of literature from around the world. An exemplary one. And Wendy. Well, I would um, encourage everyone to um, just keep the faith. It's really, really, really hard. I mean, there's. Um, this wonderful essay that Anton Herr published, I don't know, a couple of years ago um, about the um, long valley of death of the translator between the time when you get your first journal publications and the time you have your first book. I was in the long valley of death for 11 years. And, you know, obviously I'm not trying to earn my living as a translator of poetry, but there are a lot of reasons that getting poetry and translation published in the United States is enormously difficult. Um, and when you are working with um, original literature that is written by writers who are marginalized in their home communities and marginalized on a global level, um, that can make it infinitely more complicated, uh, but also really, really important. And so, you know, I don't want to give sort of, oh, do X or oh, do Y. I guess what I would say is do everything A to Z. Try to get the person's work out there. You know, one of the things that I heard very early in my career as a writer, not as a translator, was um, editors are getting to know you as they're rejecting you. And I think that's really important. Um, and every time I feel that every time I put an Indigenous author's work in front of an editor, I'm asking them to think again about what work they're publishing and why and what work are they not publishing. And so just continuing to send the work out there, do readings, share it however you can uh, is really important. Uh, and it's also really fun because um, one of the things I find about my translation is that I can be 100% excited about the work that I'm sharing of these wonderful original literatures, whereas for my own writing, there's always that um, kind of itch of, oh, is this writing really ready? Is this is, is this work really worthy? But I know when I choose to translate something that the original work is absolutely worthy. So it's easier to advocate really strongly for it. And I can see your your eyes dilating as you talk about that passion for your, your authors. Um, we're getting near the end, but I was going to add um, networking. I heard that and I heard about publishing in the small presses and great places to network. Um, the Penn Translation Committee, who has sponsored this along with Penn America, a um, group of translators who get together, um, I think we, we're now going to get together every month. We used to be every other month. But you network, you meet fellow translators. Another place is ALTA, the American Literary Translators Association, with their conference coming up in November, where you meet lots of translators and you see the you meet the editors. And there are roundtables and panel discussions on how to get published. And you can, um, ALTA also has pitch sessions where if you're a member of Alta, you can arrange to have a one-on-one -on -one with an editor and sell your sell your your, your novels, sell your poetry. Um, the small presses are there as well. And then the other place is AWP. Uh, lots of people get scared of AWP because there are thousands of people there at the conference. It'll be in Kansas City next February. There are 10,000 or 13,000 people, but the book fair is wall-to-wall -wall editors, and you can determine ahead of time which publications publish translations and which presses publish translations and map out your your chart ahead of time and get to talk face to face and get an answer between the lines. When someone tells you something in writing, you don't know. You know they're saying that or they're being nice, but when they're there in their face, you can read their face and they go, well, yeah, that, 
it's or the, we've never really done that before and you're like oh, okay um so those are other ideas for the question that we actually had in the audience was um a question about speaking to getting published in the process and we have now come to the end um it's been an an hour and 30 minutes of wonderful readings, wonderful discussions. Thanks to you, the readers. Thanks to Pan America and the Pan America Translation Committee and Aliyah Gatto for doing our tech and to Alex Zucker for getting us started. And um, just, we, we couldn't do this without a lot of people working behind the scenes. And thank you to my co-organizers, Catherine Young and Esperanza Hope Snyder, who has been the backup. But Catherine's been also doing a little bit of, of back channeling too. Um, and with that audience, we couldn't do it without you. And we thank you too. So we will say good night or good morning, depending mm -hmm. where you are. All right.